Good morning, Hosanna. Well, here we are online entirely again. We did this much of last year, and some of you have been doing it all the way along, but others have been in the building. And so isn't it wonderful we have this kind of technology available to us these days, and we can continue to worship together. We can continue to hear God's word together, uh, even though we're not in the same place. Joanne and I are not even in the same place for this one, yeah. um, uh, but we're with you. We're with you in spirit and uh, all as well. Um, a couple quick announcements before we get started. Normally, worship service we have an announcement time that's us today um, we want to really make sure that we are able to stay connected as as a congregation um, it's this has gone we, originally this was to be a two-week hiatus <laughs> uh, and of course we're near, coming in nearly on a year now of, um, of doing this at a distance and some of you we haven't been able to see for some time so we did early on in the pandemic a virtual foyer one occasion, and uh, we're going to start that up again. We're going to do once a uh, month on a Wednesday evenings, which is basically just a chance to meet on Zoom um, in an online meeting room uh, to meet with one another, get caught up with one another. And Deb Helt is going to lead that that, that right. kind of experience. So the first of those is Wednesday night. And we want to make sure you know that you had an invitation to that. Go on the website, there'll be a link and there'll be an opportunity and instructions to get to that. We're also trying to stay connected. Last week, we introduced a connection card that uh, when you're online, you find that on um, either on the website or on the YouTube um, uh, video below the uh, the video in the in the, in the um, introductions, the comment section or whatever. There's a number of links now, and one of them is a connection card. So you can let us know how you're doing, uh, whether you're a guest or you're a longtime uh, member. The only other announcement that I'm aware of is that on February 20th, there's a Kid Venture Dinner Theater, which sounds really cool. And mm -hmm. there's information about that on the website as well. So make sure you, if you're just going to YouTube here or you're going through Facebook, make sure you go to the website and check out that to make sure you get caught up with all those announcements. Yep. Okay. Well, as you know, if you've listened to us for any length of time, I like to use humor to introduce messages. <laughs> um, so are you ready for a good pun today? Well, actually, sorry, no puns to start things off today. And in part, that's because today's topic is, is, is deadly serious. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the topic is death itself. And, and frankly, there's just been far too much of it lately to try to make jokes about it, right. at least right now. I was at yet another funeral last weekend. This one was for an uncle who passed away unexpectedly. And some of you have been at funerals lately too, or expect to be at some soon. And there's just so much sadness out there. Mm -hmm. We don't want to spend our days at funerals. We want to spend them with the people we go to funerals for. Mm -hmm. There's a um, ancient story of a faraway king who, uh, one point asked the historians of his realm to write the most comprehensive story of humankind they could. Tell me everything that happened. And so they spent decades distilling everything that they could find out about the history of humanity into one book after another. And they were hundreds and hundreds of volumes. But by the time they were finished, the king was on his deathbed. He couldn't read any of it. Mm -hmm. He asked them, could you give me a one sentence summary of the history of humanity? And they replied with this. People were born, they suffered, and they died. Wow. Mm. Pretty depressing, isn't it? Surely there's more than just that. Thomas Hobbes, 16th century philosopher in Europe, said something similar. He said, the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, that's really laying it on pretty thick. And if we want to be a little more contemporary, this attitude or this philosophy has not gone away. In one of his novels, Stephen King said simply, life sucks and then you die. <laughs> and seriously, if we think of it that way and only that way, right. it will always be sad. And we know this, don't we? For some people, it is. Most people, however, find it ways, other ways to deal with life's interruptions uh, death's interruptions and the losses that come from it. And there's a variety of ways we do this. Some tempted with death-defying feats. You think here maybe are the members of the Walenda family that are walking on tightropes generation after generation, despite 
losing some members of their family to death. Others just poke fun at death. One of my favorite stories, the creators of the bass playing, high-fiving Grim Reaper of the Bill and Ted movies. Uh, just trying to add a little humor to try to make it a little bit lighter. Some go the opposite direction. They immerse themselves in a culture of death. They mm -hmm. get immersed in, in whatever is dark and gloomy, maybe to become anesthetized to its terror. So it doesn't seem quite as scary. Mm. Some try to minimize the power of death. Uh, one of my favorites, the poet John Don, who wrote, uh, Death be not proud. Death, thou shalt die. And yes, he was right. Mm -hmm. Some try to find meaning in it. Like another philosopher, the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, who said, it is not death that a man should fear, but he should fear never beginning to live. Yes. Wow. Well, that's... That's true, too. Well, the last two Sundays, we talked about beginning to live in ways that Marcus Aurelius, by the way, never understood, because mm -hmm. we know and we have experienced what he did not. We've experienced what Christ has done. Yeah. He changed everything about death. He made it possible not merely to face down death here on this earth, but even to be resurrected from it. Not just someday in the future, right. but here and now. So we can live a full, abundant, God-filled resurrection life now in this world, in this lifetime. Yes. And we've said over this past couple of weeks that there are two kinds of resurrection, physical and spiritual. Why? Well, because there are two kinds of death. The death of our physical body, yes, which is what we focus on most. But there's even the more tragic death of our spirit, yeah. which is what our focus is today. Yeah. At the end of last week's message, we ask a question and we want to pick up on today or the message that we did two weeks ago, actually, because last week we kept them a little bit uh, more informal and had more of a conversation with you. But we asked that question two weeks ago. Why aren't most people living in resurrection now? Right. Why aren't they? Why are so many people spiritually dead if Christ has already done it for us? And the question that perhaps is most relevant for today, how do we get dead? Yes spiritually in the first place so today we're going to pick that up and in one sense we, we feel this and we felt this as we were preparing this message isn't as much fun as the last two that we gave you or, or last week's more informal kind of conversation we we're rejoicing then in the good news of how god has triumphed uh, over death in our life but uh, but don't worry uh, this one is not without some good news of its own perhaps you'll recognize yourself in it a bit but hopefully you'll also be encouraged that death does not have to get the last word. Yeah. In fact, it never does. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a paradox, isn't it? That the start of the process through which we get, get dead is that we get born. We come into this world so beautifully alive as babies. Um, we come into this world with a God-given determination to live. There's that in us from God that just is an intensity, an intense desire to want to, to live and to grow and to experience everything that this life can offer. Now, of course, as babies, we're not consciously thinking about these things yet. We're simply being who God created us to be, curious, full of wonder, wanting to see and touch and taste everything wanting to connect with everyone, especially those who are loving and caring for us. See, we are born imprinted with the likeness and image of God. Every one of us are, every human being, knit together in their mother's womb, imprinted with the likeness and image of God. And, and that image of God includes the deep desire to love and be loved. And yet notice that we are born ready to enjoy life in the world as God originally created it, right? We come into the world and we're ready to participate in shared satisfying relationship, not only with God, but with others. We come ready to care for creation together, you know, to multiply, fill the, the world with life together. And, and that life comes in so, so many ways and, and we want to offer it and be part of it. Mm -hmm. We're born ready to walk intimately with God in the cool of the evening, to, to know who God created us to be, and, and to not want to be anyone or anything else 
than the person that God created us to be, not to do anything else than what God created us to do. We come into the world, we are born ready to be confident of the essential goodness and beauty of everything that God's created, including ourselves. Yes, we are born beautifully alive with the deep desire to live as God originally designed us to live. But we know the rest of the story, don't we? How like, like those first few, those first human beings in the garden, we turn our gaze away from our loving creator and we become focused on created things instead. In the Genesis story, they wanted um, the fruit that God had put off limits and they wanted it so badly that they were willing to turn their backs on God and take things into their own hands, literally, to get what they wanted. Now, of course, there's a lot to talk about in this story, but what's important to notice this, this morning is the way that their choice reordered the world. Now, stay with me on this. Some of you have heard some of this before over the years, but some of you are new to this, so just stay. Stay with me that the, their choice to turn away from God, the creator, and turn toward something created, reordered everything. God is love. That's what the scriptures tell us. So God originally created according to love's design. God created out of the love that is the three-in-one trinity. God created everything, everything that is, was created as an interconnected whole, just as the, the trinity is an interconnected whole. And God was the source of it all, spiritually and physically. So notice that when the man and woman turned their backs on God as their spiritual source, they created a spiritual separation between themselves and God because that's what sin does. Sin separates. And spiritual death came along with sin as, as the ultimate separation of all. Now, I hope we're together. Remember, when God told them not to eat the fruit, when he put that particular tree off limits, God also told them what the consequence would be if they did eat it. He said, you will surely die. But they took control and they ate that fruit anyway. But they didn't die physically because physical death wasn't the issue. Spiritual death, separation from the spiritual source of their lives, that was the issue. And that's clearly seen in the consequences that unfolded from their choice. In rejecting God as their spiritual source, they died spiritually. They no longer saw each other or the world in the beautiful interconnected wholeness of God's design. After the fall, they saw things very differently. They saw only through the disordering, separating deathliness of sin's design. Mm -hmm. You see, God's design originally was all about love. Love unites. But what they chose was the separating effect of sin's design. And everything that followed that choice, everything that followed the fall, everything that issued out of their spiritual death is sin's design for us. And also notice, and this is very important, in Genesis 3, God never curses the man or woman. I know, I was taught that too. We've all been, pretty much all of us in Western Christianity have been taught that God cursed humanity. Read it again. The serpent is cursed, the ground is cursed, but God does not curse us. Why would he curse us? We carry his likeness and image. To curse us would be in some way to curse himself, right? No, God didn't curse us. God is showing us something. He was showing them, and obviously it continues to be true. God is showing us how seriously he honors the choices that we make and that we're responsible for our actions in this world and that there's consequences for our actions. 
in essence, what God is doing is not saying now, this is what I'm doing to you because of what you did. No, he's explaining how, what the, he's explaining the consequences of the choice that they made to reject him as their spiritual source. So in rejecting him as their spiritual source, they died spiritually. And in doing that, they turn themselves over. They enslave themselves to their physical sources. And the consequences of those physical sources and it just show us the harshness of sin's design. Let's take a look at that. What was the man's physical source? Where did the, the man come from physically? The ground, right? So Genesis 3.17. The consequence then of turning from the spiritual source for authority to be under their spiritual source of God as love is that now things are turned upside down, inside out. The ground is what will rule over the man. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust and to dust you shall return. What's God saying? He's saying because of what you did, because you chose sin's design over my design, life and work are going to be very, very hard in this deathly disordered world. And then God speaks to the woman. And what was the, the woman's physical source? Remember where she came from physically? the side of the man, right? So watch this. In pain, you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. In Genesis 1 and 2, what do we see? The woman, the man and the woman were created to stand side by side, equal, the creation mandate was given to both of them. You steward this creation for me, God said. And together, multiply, fill the earth with life. But now, this design that God would be the source over the man and woman who are standing together, who are to be spirit, stewarding creation for God, it gets turned upside down. Now, the woman who was created to stand as an equal with the man, is now living in a disordered world of their own creation. And she was still going to be longing for that shared relationship, but that is not what sin does. She's longing for the shared relationship. But what does it say? It says now her physical source is gonna rule over her. It's no longer this, it's this, patriarchy man over the woman and he'll rule and this is not benevolent rulership the word in hebrew there is is a word that literally means rule he will rule over her with iron fisted domination this is the same word that's used of pharaoh's relationship to the hebrew slaves this is not god's design at all this is consequences of the separating disordering effect of sin. And what's God saying now? Because you've turned away from me as your spiritual source. Now, physically, in this world, family and relationships are going to be very, very painful. Wow. And you know, history has gone on and went on century after century. History clearly shows us that humanity has continued to live in the death dealing consequences of sin's design. Yes, we're still created and born for the world that God had originally designed for us in love. That is still true. We come into this world wanting to live in the world that God created for us. But once we're in this world, it doesn't take long for sin and death to make their power known, does it? Well, someone's going to get hurt. 
Do you remember hearing that from your, from your parents? Maybe in your childhood or yelling that to your kids or your grandkids yourself? The big warning in my childhood home was about the electric fence that my Uncle John installed between our two houses. I was raised with my two sisters and then my uncle and my aunt were neighbors and they had six kids. And, and we cousins, we played together all the time, which meant that we were constantly running over two lines of electric fence that were between our houses. So we'd run under it at full speed sometimes, ducking as fast as we could in order to keep moving as fast as we could. Uh, sometimes we'd ride our bikes at full speed up to a slam on the brakes, duck under and try to get our bikes under and uh, out to the other side and well. And uh, we'd laugh off the warning until one of us in the process of doing that would zap a knuckle or worse, the sensitive spot in the back of our heads. You ever get that zap by an electric wire? Ouch! And uh, oh, I forgot to show you the comic. I told you this would happen if you ran with scissors. That's a snowman. Now, there, there's a little bit of humor for us today. Don't run with scissors. Well, this is what happens. You get struck, gets, gets uh, shocked by an electric fence. And inevitably, no matter the warning, someone would get hurt. And then, of course, there'd be tears and regrets and apologies and the promise of, yes, mom, I'll be more careful the next time. We weren't. <laughs> And we do it all again. And life is like that, isn't it? There's so many metaphorical fences waiting to zap us in this world. And what happens is that we get hurt. And yeah. sometimes it's a little hurt, and sometimes it's a lot of hurt, but it adds up. And pain changes us. And this is what sin does to us. Yeah. Scripture refers to us in this state as broken, um, broken hearted. Yeah. And um, we probably all know what that feels like, don't, um, don't we? we? We want to trust life. We want to trust people, but our hearts get broken by the pain that we've received, by the consequences of sin and how it's hurt our relationships, just like Joanne was discussing. Right. And that's why um, we were at a, um, a faculty event a few years ago. One of our seminary colleagues just gave us some wisdom that continues to resonate with me. I think we've mentioned it too on more one occasion here. Um, when you see someone doing something you don't understand, instead of asking what's wrong with that person, ask instead what's happened to them. Yes. Because almost always there's some kind of pain in that story. It explains. Maybe it doesn't justify, and we, but we all have that. We all have our pain and we have our ways of acting out. We have the ways that we've gotten hurt. And what's really sad is that sometimes, sometimes we get hurt on purpose. Someone wants to hurt us out of revenge or because we resemble someone who once hurt them or out of the twisted need to simply have someone else be in pain because, because they are. Yeah. Uh, Abel was killed by his brother out of simple jealousy. Jesus was killed by the mob out of fear. The Bible is full of these sad stories. Why? Because life is. The world is full of them. People are everywhere marginalized and ostracized and criticized by others who judge them for being less, for doing less than what others want. And again, we all know this, don't we? We carry those own scars. Sometimes we've been the ones pointing the fingers. Right. We know what this feels like, some of us more deeply than others. Most of the time, though, the hurt is not intentional. Uncle John didn't put his fence up to electrocute his nephews and nieces, <laughs> much less his own kids. He didn't even put it up to harm the cows. He put it up because he was a good farmer and the cows weren't safe if they wandered off the property. Mm. And the electric shock was actually quite mild. It didn't hurt any, it didn't cause any damage to anybody. It only felt intense because we were eight. <laughs> there was good intent in the electric fence but good intent gave us just as strong a zap as bad intent mm. and so is much life we don't intend necessarily to diminish demean or demoralize each other most of the time we don't want to inflict harm right just like our parents warned us if you keep that up someone get hurt yep. and someone does and what do we do when we get hurt? What do we do when we get hurt by sin? Of anything. We instinctively react. Ouch! We pull back. Or we strike out. We want to protect ourselves from more pain. And, and we want to anesthetize 
the pain we already feel. And this is all very instinctive. We don't think long and hard about it. We don't plan our response to pain. We just do it. But much of what we do in that moment that's supposed to help us, that we think is going to make things better, really doesn't. Not in the long run. In fact, often it makes things worse. And maybe one day we wake up and find that out that our pain has turned into, because of how we dealt with it, into something far worse than the original uh, hurt itself. Yeah. Now, do you recognize yourself at all in this story? Well, at least a little bit. This is the human story since the fall, since the garden. This is what life has done to us. This is what sin has done to us. And this is what we have done with life, every single one of us. Because somewhere along the way, many somewheres probably, we got hurt. Yeah. So we get born and we put our true God created selves out there for the world to see, for our, our, those we love to see. But rather than being loved and celebrated, we get hurt. Mm -hmm. We feel exposed, unloved, we feel unaccepted, we feel shamed, we feel mm -hmm. so many painful things. Mm -hmm. And we vow deep within that I will never allow myself to hurt like this again. Yep. It's not safe, we determine. It's not safe to be my true God created self. So I'll become my own God. And I'll create another false self to hide behind. And it's just like those fig leaf garments that the, 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 the man and the woman hiding in the garden made for themselves. See, they got hurt, didn't they? They made a, a, a bad choice, but they put themselves out there and they got hurt. And then they created something false and they tried to hide, right? We create, we do what they did. We create a false identity to get the love and acceptance that we want. And in doing that, we get duped. See, we think by doing all of this, we're, we're getting control, but we're actually getting conned. See, like Esau, oh, he thought he was in control. He traded the glory and goodness of his God-given birth, birthright for a pot of stew and a piece of bread. Mm. And like him, we trade the glory and goodness of our God-given selves for something created that only lasts for a moment, some temporary costume. I think, Tony, you had said it that way, some temporary fig leaf costume yeah. that we put on. See, we clothe ourselves in, in these, these self-made costumes and we play act a role on the stage of this world. And then we wonder why after decades of living in this illusion, we feel separate and alone. We continue to feel unknown and unloved. And we wonder why do, are we so empty in the core of our being? Maybe wonder what's wrong with all those people out there that they don't get me. Yeah. We end up being isolated, separated from each other, separated from ourselves, yep. separated from God. We forget who we are. We forget who God is. We forget where home is. Right. And as a result, we get lost. Jesus talked a lot about being lost. Talked about a lost coin, valued and needed by its owner. We talked about a lost sheep, valued and loved by the shepherd. We yeah. talked about a lost son, valued and anguished over by his father, yes. who represents God, our father in this story. God has a special affection for lost things and lost people, it seems. And we're glad he does. Because being lost, particularly losing ourselves, is a miserable situation to be in. When we're lost, we wander without knowing where we're going. Right. It's like visiting a foreign country, lost among signs written in a language we can't read. Where do I go? 
or like driving unfamiliar roads in the dark with, without GPS or a map. Where do I go? Trying desperately to find something familiar, something that's going to point the way home, point us to where we need to be. I've done both of those things. I don't like either of them. Mm -hmm. Some people never do find their way home. And by that, I don't just mean a place to belong to in this world, but a place to belong to themselves. Some people, maybe it's most, are restless their whole lives. Mm -hmm. Never having truly come home to themselves or having come home to God, which by the way, is one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. They spend their lives, like Joanne was saying, trying on this and that, trying on their costumes of fig leaves. The personas, oh, maybe I'll be this person this, the, today. They try on different relationships. They try on different possessions. Something out here is going to work. They try on addictions and attractions. They try on adventures. If I just have the right amount of pizzazz of my life, then I'm really going to feel like I'm alive finally. They try on different churches. They try to find something that fits. Yep. Not realizing it is they that does not yet fit. Mm -hmm. Not the stuff out there. Right. And it's also very sad. The biblical image of this is the people of Israel wandering for 40 years out in the wilderness when their trip, by the way, was not terribly that long. It should have taken them maybe three months. So why did they wander like that for so long? Well, the spiritual answer we can give, looking back one, is because the destination wasn't the only point of their journey. In order to live in a land of promise, they needed to discover something about themselves again. They needed to shake off the bonds and habits of slavery in Egypt because they too have been duped. They too have been had lost uh, their their identity as the free people loved them. They were exploited by by other people. They had to shake all that off so they could live like free people, worship God out of freedom and gratitude. And it took them that long. It took them a generation yeah. to make that necessary change, to discover themselves in God for real, yes. and to get over the temptation to create golden calves. Something else out there that will give me meaning. And our wanderings are often for the same reason and with the same frustrations, sometimes for the same duration. And again, Joanne and I are not telling you something here today that's probably strikingly brand new we know this intuitively maybe not in these words or connecting the dots this way but we know this we've all been there to a greater or less extent we've been hurt we've been duped we've been enslaved we've been lost yep yep and besides our own experience we know other people the same kind of story yep people that you love the people are part of your life that you're concerned about this universal human condition is what we mean by spiritual death yep and today, all we're trying to do is describe what it looks like, what it feels like, and help it connect to what your experience is. Your life has doubtless given you illustrations of it that are different than the ones that we've shared here. But you recognize the patterns, don't you? Mm -hmm. You felt the pain. And none of us want to live like this. To live alive biologically, but dead spiritually. To just count the days while life sucks and then we die. Nor does God want us to live like this. This isn't God's doing. This isn't what was planned in the garden. This isn't what we were created for. It wasn't what we were born to do. God has had a different story for us all along. And that story is for real and for good. And it's still here. It's not just past tense. He has come to redeem us in order to make that possible for us again. When we want it. Mm -hmm. When we're ready. When we're ready for what? Now, here's the irony. This is the fun part about this. The only solution, the only way out of this deathliness is to get more dead. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Think about it. We are dead in sin already. That's the problem. We're living with the consequences of sin, which is spiritual death. Now let's get dead to sin. Yes. Remember what Paul told the Romans? We quoted this on two, two weeks ago. Consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Yep. So to be resurrected, guess what? 
We have to die first. Like a seed is buried in the dark soil, Jesus said, before it springs forth as new life. And when we die to our deathliness, when we get more dead, all the junk that came with it, all that pain, that lostness, the fakeness, the, tr- the, the, the costumes, everything else, all that can die too. It can die. And then God can ra- will raise us to new life, free at last, free at last. So that we are alive with him, for him, and in him. Yes. I am crucified with Christ. Paul nearly shouted that to the Galatians. Nevertheless, I live. And all who have been resurrected can shout that same testimony, can tell that same story. You know this too, don't you? Many of you, most of you perhaps, you know what this is like. Nevertheless, I live because I have become dead through all of that. Yeah. When we are made alive, we can indeed live uh, resurrection today and tomorrow and forever. Die alive and live. Yeah. It's such a paradox. It's uh, such mystery, isn't it? And just how beautifully intertwined it all is that we died spiritually and our physical sources enslaved us, you know, had power over us. And God's divine order was disordered into sin's design. But how beautifully paradoxical, ironic, mysterious, whatever word you want to use, that God became physical. He became human. (laughs) Right? So that Jesus could die our death physically. Why? So we could live again spiritually, so that we could live his life spiritually. He died our death so we could live his life. The New Testament is full of this. I mean, we'll talk about more of this as we go through the year, but Jesus tore down the wall of hostility, right? Sin, separating wall of hostility and violence that, that, that separates us from God, from ourselves, from others. He tore that down at the cross so that we might be freed from the power of sin's design and be reconciled and restored to God's original design of love now. Just as, as Tony just so beautifully um, taught. And I, we're not making this up, folks, because I don't, because we've been looking through a lens that has called us cursed when we're not and just hasn't understood the whole picture. We miss some really important details. Did you ever notice? that as Jesus suffered and died, he took into his physical body the very consequences that we brought upon ourselves at the very beginning. Remember the man's physical source came from the ground. And what were the consequences of that sinful separation? Thorns and thistles are going to come forth from the ground and make human survival very, very hard. Did you notice what Jesus wore? As he was being mocked, what he wore to the cross, he wore a crown of thorns on his head. He was physically reversing sin's design. He was taking the consequences of sin into himself, and there you go. That consequence, oh, he's reversing. The physical source will no longer rule over us. He's crowned with it so that he spiritually can become our Lord and our savior. And it doesn't stop there. The woman, remember? Wow, what was the consequences? That she was going to be longing for oneness in a a one flesh relationship again. And, And 
that longing for oneness, you know, that had made human relationships so very, very painful. And that whole male ruling over female, all of that, but notice something. Her source was what? Her physical source was the side of the man. Did you notice? Jesus took a spear in his side that pierced his heart. Why? Because he was also reversing and he was reversing sin's design, not only for men, but for women. And for the way that we relate, not only to each other, but to God. And that, yes, <laughs> yes, we would be restored to our spiritual source women, as well as men, all humanity, and to the longing for oneness that can finally, spiritually, be made real and whole again through Christ. Jesus took our, he took the physical consequences, right? He took the physical consequences of pain and separation and death so that we might be reunited with our spiritual source, the God of love, freed from the power of sin and death and freed for the power of resurrected life in the spirit. Wow. We have, that's a lot. We, and, and we have so much more to say, but you know, all of this raises the next question. So if all of this is true, and by the way, it is, then why do we choose to continue living a deathly existence? If all of this is true and we're that free and we're that restored and we're that whole spiritually, again, if everything's been restored to us as it was in Eden, why do we choose to continue to live a deathly existence? That's the message for next week. Yeah. I'm real excited, Tony. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just got all, <sighs> yeah, it's we such good news. We, 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 we know now how we get dead. The question is, how, why, why would we stay dead? I know. Why, would, why do we stay dead? Uh, the good news is we don't have to. And as we continue talking about this over the coming weeks, um, I, Hopefully more and more freedom will continue to come, but we're gonna close this week's message with um, a, a declaration of faith, um, a declaration of gratitude to the God who has done what was necessary for us to come home and to be who he created us to be and to do what he's created us to do in this world. So I'm going to be the one um, in this, this responsive prayer. Um, and Tony, you can, at, wherever you are listening to this, um, you can join Tony in voicing the all part that's in bold on the slides. Thanks be to God, the Lord is here. The Spirit is with us. We need not fear. His spirit is with us. We are freed from sin's power. His spirit is with us. We are freed from death's sting. His spirit is with us. We are raised to new life. His spirit is with us. We are surrounded by love. His spirit is with us. We are immersed in peace. His spirit is with us. We rejoice in hope. His spirit is with us. And we will now go to live what we have dared to pray. His spirit is with us. Thanks, Thanks be, to be to God. Amen and amen.